back to Anatomy of Algebra. This episode is searching for a cubic formula. In our last two episodes, we've done uh, solving a linear equation, solving a quadratic equation, a degree two equation. And so it seems natural to go to degree three today in the sense of that we like counting and we like doing things in order. There's a couple other reasons why we in particular have a reason to get to the cubic at this point. In our first episode, I talked about the invention of algebraic notation, the x's and the equations and all that stuff, and, and said a little something about that this was a good invention, that it made algebra easier, it made algebra more powerful. And yet, what did we do with it? A linear equation. We solved the kind of problem that could be solved 4,000 years ago, not something that you need this fancy new notation for. Same thing with the quadratics. You do them in school, and that's how you learn how to use algebra, but quadratics were very much old news by the time the Italians started inventing this sort of notation. Getting to the cubic, being able to solve the cubic, at least gets some sort of parity for us in terms of algebraic notation and the kinds of problems it was equal to, or it was needed to be able to, to sort of leap to in order to improve humanity's problem-solving capabilities. So when the Italians invented these algebraic notations and using X and things like that. Although again, X comes from Descartes. They didn't do it to solve linear equations. They didn't do it to solve quadratic equations. They did it to solve cubic equations. The other reason why we might care about cubic equations is that in school we do solve linear equations. We do solve quadratic equations. And for the most part, we stop there. You might be wondering, well, why do we stop there? Is it just because we're bored and we don't want to solve any more equations? Is it because the cubic equation is too hard? Is it because you need something better than algebra? There's not really a clear picture on it and people don't usually ask a whole lot of questions. Um, you just sort of never notice that you get to the cubic equation. We today are going to tackle the cubic equation. This is going to take a few sections. It's going to turn out that not only is it hard to write down the cubic formula, whereas you all have probably memorized the quadratic formula. Not only is it hard to show why the cubic formula works, but it's also hard to even use the cubic formula. Now, I'm not going through this because all these things are hard and because I want to do something difficult for you that you wouldn't be able to do yourself, but because I think along the way, we get to ask a lot of interesting questions that can give us ideas about some other things to do. Cubics do sometimes come up in school. So in an algebra class, you might be asked to solve an equation like this. And that is a cubic. Absolutely, that's a cubic. But that's kind of an easy cubic, right? Why is that an easy cubic? It's because this factors. I can pull an x out of here. And then if I'm really on top of things, I notice that what I'm looking at inside also factors. It's a difference of squares. And besides showing you that uh, an easy cubic comes up at this stage, I also, in terms of us like sort of revisiting algebra and what's actually happening when you're doing the problems in school, wanted to talk about how a person jumps from this to the next line of their algebra homework. So what comes after this? What's the next thing you write? You write x equals 0 plus or minus 3. And even saying exactly what you mean by that might get lost on a few people who are just racing to get an answer to put the box around. So what this means, supposedly, is that there are three solutions to this problem, and those three solutions are 0, 3, and minus 3. Now what is it that allows me to jump to that conclusion? I mean, there's sort of a pattern matching. I can see that if I plug 0 in there, then that will be 0, and that to make this one 0, I plug in 3. To make that one 0, I plug in minus 3. But why does that solve the equation as a whole? Well, certainly you could check and see that that works out. That works fine. There's a, there's a little bit of inference that's happening here, and it's worth pointing out now, because when we get farther ahead in math, when we start doing the kind of math that happens after 1800, we can't always make this inference. So it's worth noting that we did make the inference this, this time. And what we're saying is that this whole thing turns out to be zero. And this whole thing is made up of three numbers multiplied together for any choice of x. It's three numbers multiplied together that gives you zero. And if you have three numbers multiplied together to give you zero, the only way that turns out to be zero is if one of those numbers was zero. 
And so technically what's happening is that we're saying this leads to three separate equations. And we're finding the solution to each of those. And this leads has to do with that little bit of logic. If a product of numbers gives you zero, then one of the numbers itself has to be zero. And again, that's interesting to point out for us here now because it's not always going to be true. We're going to work in some worlds where you can get zero for multiplying without any of the individual factors being zero. And that's kind of cool. So anyway, in uh, algebra class, you might see cubics like this. And the idea is to sort of get better at the game of noticing factors. But what happens if I give you a different sort of cubic? How about this one? All right, yeah, let's see you factor that. What? You know how to factor that? I do what? Oh, so if I look at this, I can factor out an x squared, and I'm left with x plus 1. And then if I look at this, I'm left up with just x plus 1. And so that's the same thing as being able to factor out x plus 1 from the whole thing and having x squared plus 1 on the inside. Well, sure enough, you're right, that one does factor. Ah, maybe this is a little harder to write down ones that don't factor than I was thinking of. Um, well, let's try again. What if I do something really tricky and just put a minus there instead? There we go. That is an officially unfactorable, irreducible cubic. I'd like to see you factor that. Okay, so if you read any history of algebra or broadly math, they make a big deal, as I've done here, about the Italians in the 1500s, finally learning to solve cubics like this. Uh, I always took it to be a great triumph of the new symbolic methods in algebra, and that's the way a lot of the books play it up. Of course, we've seen enough of the timeline to know that that doesn't quite match up. Already with Cardano, you know, one of the earlier guys in this group, we looked back at his work, and it doesn't look like what we would call algebra. So maybe that story's a little bit backwards. Maybe it goes the other way around. Maybe having the power to solve a problem like this, to be able to dig into these cubics that had been around for a long time and people didn't know how to dig into, maybe that was enough to pull people along and say, let's get better at writing this stuff down so that we can show people how this is working. I don't know. Maybe it's a chicken and egg kind of a thing. Maybe it's more complicated than that. But I know that the initial story that I was told, and I'm used to telling people like you, is not quite true in that sense. And this won't be the last time with math history that we'll end up learning that something that we learned turns out not to be very true. If it's not the case that, that they got these new x's and stuff and then we're able to learn how to solve cubic equations, why are the equations such a big deal? Are they? Is solving a cubic a big deal? I don't know, we might want to look more into that. But if so, if this is this great triumph story, why is, it, why is that the story that I'm telling you rather than the one that you come out of algebra class knowing? More specifically, I, I can come up with a few questions like this. One, what actually is the cubic formula? You all have to learn the quadratic formula. I had to learn the quadratic formula. What actually is the cubic formula? How do we actually use it? Which turns out to be a harder question than you'd think. The plug and chug isn't so easy this time around. What questions about numbers and arithmetic come up along the way? We had that small question last time about the square root of 13 coming up in, in rational numbers, and what does that really mean? And we, of course, didn't answer it, but, but it came up. Um, so what kinds of questions about numbers might come up along the way as we're trying to solve these cubic equations? Number four, why is solving the cubic important? You know, who cares? Uh, if, it's, if it's all that important, then... Why didn't you learn how to do it in high school? And then five, why don't you learn how to do it in high school? Is there, was there um, some public school administrator way far back or some president or something, and they really hated cubics and so struck it from the curriculum? Or is there something else going on there? So that's, that's the set of questions that I'd like to try and answer in this episode of Anatomy of Algebra. The way this is gonna work is in our first two sections that follow this, I'll show you the cubic formula this analog for the quadratic formula that you know from high school. We'll see that plug and chug isn't as simple as you might hope. And then at the same time, 
we'll get to see some some fun numbers coming up. Like complex numbers are gonna poke their heads out like Punxsutawney Phil. And after we, we use the cubic formula, we're gonna see where it comes from and why it's true. That'll be section three. It's kind of cool that we can do something really similar to what we did with the quadratic, where we, we draw a situation out with geometry, this time it'll be in three dimensions, and then use that to figure out what's going on with the equations and actually transform this equation to something that looks like x equals and then all just known constants and arithmetic on the other side. And then at the, the very end we might ask what other questions we have at this point. What, what, now that we know how to solve the cubic, now that we know where it comes from, what kinds of new questions can we ask? And so without any further ado, here we go. Episode 3, Anatomy of Algebra, Searching for a Cubic.